Hello, and welcome to Soothing Pod's Sleep Stories. Tonight, we're going to explore the story of Babe the Blue Ox as he grows and finds love on a beautiful woodland farm. Before we begin, let us take a moment to shed the weight of the day and relax fully. Imagine the air around you as a glowing, warm light. As you inhale, imagine that light filling your body. Can you feel it steaming inside you, inviting you to relax all your muscles and find peace in this moment? On the exhale, Don't be afraid to make a little noise. Imagine the stresses and obligations of the day leaving your lips as you push that breath out. You no longer need to carry them with you. Let's pause now for five seconds. This moment Here and now is your moment to be free and untethered. Feel the weightlessness of your body as you lay in your soft bed. Doesn't it feel so nice to just lay in bed? Now that we've found comfort in the space we are in, Let us begin. Years and years ago, in the frigid north, a lumberjack stood at 18 feet tall. His name was Paul Bunyan, and he was the most beloved man in his community. Because of his size, Paul could do the work of an entire logging team in a single day. He loved working out in the sun among the trees and the flowers, with nothing speaking to him but the whispering wind. Paul made a cozy farm for himself tucked up in the mountains of the town. He had everything he could ever want. Large, rolling fields of green, clear ponds full of fish, miles of crops that were always vibrant in color and in taste. But Paul was missing one thing, a companion. You see, no one was quite Paul's size. All his chicken, pigs, and sheep were the size of normal animals, and it was a bit challenging for him to care for them. Paul longed for an animal that would be his own size, but he never knew if that day would come. One day, a brilliant snowstorm descended on the town. The dark, puffy clouds covered every inch of the sky. A chilly wind danced through the trees, under the doors, into the homes of every person in town. Paul was prepared. He curled up in a warm, fluffy wool blanket. In front of him, his fireplace crackled and popped. He closed his eyes and listened to the sizzle of the sparks in the fire and the low, steady rumble of the wind brushing against the house. The fire illuminated the entire room in a sleepy orange glow. The way the colors shifted around the room brought Paul closer and closer to sleep. He could nearly feel the comforting weight of sleep wash over him. He heard a pitter-patter across his tin roof. Opening his eyes, he saw that snow had begun to fall, only it wasn't your average snow. The snow was a beautiful light blue, It fell in huge, wet flakes that seemed to drift out of the sky 
in slow motion. Paul watched in amazement. There had been legends that the coldest snows were blue, and this certainly was the coldest snow. He watched the snow fall beyond his window pane for a long while. Those blue flakes tumbling down just outside the orange glow of his fire was a stunning contrast, one that made him think of all the beauty that can be found in the world around us. Just as he was about to drift off to sleep, Paul heard a noise ringing out from deep within the forest. He sat up, intrigued by the sound. It resembled the call of an animal, one in distress. As selfless as Paul was, he knew he had no other choice. Some little animal was out there, alone, asking for help. Paul slid on his warm wool jacket and threw a few more logs on his hungry fire. Surely, whatever animal it was would be needing a little warmth. When Paul opened his door, he was greeted by one of the most incredible sights he had ever seen. The blue snow blanketed the ground. It was unbelievably smooth, extending over the hills and valleys in what looked like a single glossy sheet. The blue snow clung to the tall pine trees, shining brightly against their dark green leaves. Even the snow falling from the sky seemed to glow against the gray, cloudy backdrop. Paul took a breath of the fresh air and followed the sound into the forest. He passed by his frozen over pond. He moved around the winding mountain, deep into the lofty grove of pine trees. The waterfall that normally flowed year-round was frozen. You could pick out each individual trickle of water as it glistened. Paul stared at it for a long moment, mesmerized by how much the waterfall looked like a diamond, suspended in place. He knew he was getting closer and closer to the cry. He walked even faster through the snow drifts. He turned into a long, beautiful field. The sheet of blue snow seemed to go on for miles. Just underneath the snowdrift he was standing on, he saw it, a tiny blue ox pacing in front of him. It jumped up in the air, trying to scale the mountain of blue snow. It huffed and puffed, a fiery little thing, frustrated with his inability to see over the snow. Paul laughed at the feisty little critter and scooped him up in his arms. The blue ox was stained blue from the cold snow. It curled up against Paul, trying to share Paul's body heat. Paul felt a surge of warmth and compassion race through his body. Do you want to come home with me, little one? He whispered. The ox nodded with its tiny little head. Paul was amazed by how adorable it was, with horns too big for its body and dark blue doe eyes. Paul lifted the ox up and tucked him in his jacket. The ox shook his body happily as he pressed himself against Paul, completely at home. The two began the long trek back over the snow. They walked past the frozen waterfall, through the grove of loft pine trees, on past the winding mountain and the icy farm pond. When they arrived back to the farmhouse, the blue ox looked around with wide, glossy eyes. Paul felt his heart skip a beat as he watched the ox gaze at the home with complete awe. 
Paul gathered up a pile of blankets and made a bed for the ox right next to the crackling fire. He gently placed the ox into his makeshift bed. This is your home now, little babe, Paul muttered, stroking the ox's head as it cozied up by the flames. Babe laid down his sleepy eyes locked on the dancing fire. Paul gave him one last pet before he settled down beside him for the night. He didn't want the little one to get scared all alone the first night. He slept there on the floor all night, his hand flat on Babe's soft fur. Quickly, the two were close friends. Babe slept next to the fire every single night with Paul by his side. As winter began to fade and the blue snow melted, spring graced the land with its presence. Every color of the rainbow was splashed across the land in swaths of wildflowers and butterflies. Babe loved to frolic through the flowers playing with the butterflies and lounging in the sun. As spring faded into summer, something odd came to light about Babe. He had only been a few months, and Babe was already double the size of an ordinary adult ox. Paul realized this wasn't an ordinary ox. This was the animal he had wished for, over all those years. Even as large as he was, Babe still curled up by the fire every night with Paul by his side. As years passed, the two were friends in work and in life. Babe could do the work of ten teams of oxen. He would hum and sing as he pulled logs down the logging road like they weighed nothing. He was the happiest ox, always taking a moment to breathe in that fresh mountain air, always taking the time to be kind to every creature he came in contact with. Babe and Paul enjoyed the bounty of nature year-round. During winter, Babe would run across the snowy fields and roll in the cool snow. Whenever a blizzard or dusting would roll through the town, Babe would jump up in the air, catching the passing flakes. During spring, Babe took naps in the fields of flowers and listened to the bird songs. Once summer washed over the land, Babe would swim under the waterfalls while Paul whittled trees on the shoreline. In fall, Babe would move leaves into a giant mountain to jump and play in. He loved the brisk smell of the crisp fall air almost as much as he loved munching on apples that had fallen off the trees. Even with all the fun and peace on the farm, Babe felt as though he was the one missing something now. Every night, when he curled up by the fire, he longed for another cow to lay beside him. He wanted the comfort of having the love of his life by his side through all the seasons. One day, Babe was doing his usual logging route. He was daydreaming when he gazed up and saw her, a yellow cow as bright as the sun. Her eyelashes were long and curled, her eyes full of wonder and excitement for the world around her. Babe forgot about work almost instantly. He scurried up the hill to be by her side. The two felt an instant connection. Bessie, the yellow cow, happily followed Babe back to the farm. The couple laid in the flowers together, watching the clouds 
roll across the bright blue sky. They didn't have a care in the world. Together, they felt free and happy, and they knew they would never be alone. When Bay brought Bessie to the front door, Paul couldn't believe his eyes. Pride and happiness swelled inside him, and he knew immediately what he had to do. Paul got to work building a barn for the couple. Naturally, he placed the biggest fireplace you have ever seen in the center of the room. Babe and Bessie slept by the fire together every night. In the crackling, warm glow, they curled up against each other, feeling grateful to have met their other half. As the days passed, Bessie began to grow just as big as Babe. She provided the farm and the town with enough milk to feed every child, make every stick of butter, and grease every pan. As the seasons passed, the farm began to flourish more than it ever had before. With winter on the horizon, the team got to work tidying up the farm and preparing for a long season. To everyone's surprise, the very first snowfall of the year came with a frigid gust of wind, the type of gust that crept under doors and froze waterfalls in place. Big, blue snowflakes cascaded out of the sky. Babe, Bessie, and Paul played in the blue snow together. They paused every so often to gaze around at the beautiful farmland that was their home. Together, they had the kind of life they had only dreamed of. Paul had two best friends instead of just one. Babe had his love by his side, and Bessie had the most fantastic home in all the land. Some say to this very day, blue snow can be found coming from the sky up north on the coldest evenings. Whenever you see that blue snow falling, know there's a farm out there that's having a cozy evening by a fire. I hope you've enjoyed this story and it has helped bring you closer to a relaxing night of sleep. Please, feel free to join me tomorrow night for another sleep story. Until then, sweet dreams. Welcome to Soothing Pods Sleep Stories. My name is Chris, and today I would like to help you relax and fall asleep, guided by my voice and the story you are about to hear. Tonight, I will tell you a story about how a nightingale's song saved the emperor's life. Before we begin, let's take some time to make sure that you are relaxed and ready to listen. Now, slowly close your eyes. Take a deep breath through your nose. Hold it. Slowly exhale through your mouth. Feel your body relax as you breathe in and out. Breathe in, breathe out, one more time, breathe in, breathe out. You are now ready to listen to the story. A long time ago, in a country named China, lived an emperor who loved owning fine and one-of-a-kind treasure. 
the emperor lived in a porcelain palace that was the most beautiful in the entire world. The castle was so delicate that one wrong touch could be enough to shatter it. So, the people who worked for him and visitors took extra care to be cautious when they visited the palace. The Emperor of China owned an exquisite garden filled with many exotic plants and flowers that he collected from all over the world. People who have visited the garden would often tell stories about how the flowers had little bells that made a tinkling sound when the wind blew softly. If you were passing by, you couldn't help but look and admire how beautiful they are. The garden extended as far as the eye could see. It was so massive that even the emperor's gardeners, who tended to the plants and flowers every day, had trouble telling where it started and ended. People who explored every inch of the garden knew that at the very edge of the garden stood a thick forest that extended down to the coast. And in that forest lived a nightingale. The nightingale sang the sweetest and amazing songs. When the nightingale sang, the people around stopped to listen, and the ships would anchor just to hear the beautiful melody that would often bring either a smile to their faces or tears to their eyes. The nightingale's song was as famous as the emperor's palace and garden. There were poets and writers from all over the world who visited the garden. They marveled at the emperor's garden and were in awe when they heard the nightingale sing. They would go on to write stories and poems about the emperor's garden and the singing bird that lived there. One day, while sitting in his throne room, one of those books reached the emperor's hands. As someone who loved reading and hearing other people praise him, the emperor read the book heartily, nodding now and then when he read the praises given to him. When he reached the part about the nightingale, his brow furrowed. Does a bird like that exist in his garden? It's embarrassing that people outside my kingdom know the contents of my garden more than I do, he said, thinking out loud. The thought bothered him so much that he summoned his court advisors and all his servants to find this mysterious bird. When his court was assembled, he addressed them. I have just read a book saying there is a bird, a nightingale, living in my garden. The bird sings the sweetest and most melodious songs. Find this bird and bring it to me, he said in his most emperor-like tone. Your majesty, we will find the bird and bring it to you, Kang, his chief servant, answered. Very well, see that you find it within a week the emperor told his court. With this, he stood up and walked out. The court murmured among themselves, how are they going to find it when they haven't seen or heard about this bird before? After much thought and discussion, they divided themselves into groups of five so that they could cover more ground. The next day, 
the people searched for the fabled nightingale throughout the land. But, unfortunately, no matter how much they tried, they didn't find a single trace of this legendary bird. This apparent lack of evidence led them to think that maybe all those stories about this bird were just that, stories. The emperor's chief servant, Kang, worried that they might never find this nightingale. But, as he was sitting in the garden, trying to clear his thoughts, a kitchen girl shyly walked towards him and tugged on his sleeves. I heard that you were looking for the nightingale, and I can lead you to it. I often go to the woods after work to listen to the nightingale sing, and its song is so soothing that no matter how tired I am, I feel refreshed after listening, the girl said. Kang stood up from where he sat and replied, Please lead me to the nightingale now, so that I can ask it to sing for the emperor. Pleased, the chief servant Kang asked her to do something meaningful for the emperor. The young girl took Kang's hand and led him to the edge of the garden and into the forest. They walked through the tall trees and, after a while, stopped in front of an ancient sawtooth oak tree. Kang looked around excitedly for the nightingale, even though he didn't know what it looked like. He imagined a large majestic bird, something like a peacock. But there was no such bird. Instead, he saw a plain-looking brown bird perched in the low branches. The kitchen girl looked up at the brown bird and said, Hello, nightingale. It is I, Ling Ling. I have come with a friend to hear you sing. Please gift us with a song. The nightingale chirped and happily obliged. The fantastic melody that came out of the nightingale brought tears of happiness to Kang's eyes. He clapped loudly when the song finished. Precious nightingale, your song is unlike any other song that I have heard in my lifetime. Please, can you come with me to the palace so that you can gladden the emperor's heart with a song? Kang asked the nightingale. The nightingale answered, It will be my pleasure to sing for the emperor. And so, that day, they presented the nightingale to the emperor in his throne room. The nightingale perched herself next to the king and sang a song. The emperor closed his eyes and listened intently to the song. All the time, a smile on his face. When the song finished, there were tears in the emperor's eyes. Please, precious nightingale, grant me the pleasure of song and sing for me every day, the emperor asked the bird. It would be my honor to sing for the emperor. I promise that I shall come every day and sing for you the nightingale said, and with this, she flew back to her home in the woods. The nightingale was true to her promise, and came every day to sing for the emperor. Each day, she sang a different song, and it wasn't long before the two became good friends. The emperor had a golden perch made for the nightingale when she came to sing for him. But she often stood on the emperor's shoulder instead, much to his delight. 
the emperor often invited guests over to hear her sing. And over time, poets and writers wrote stories and poems about the nightingale and the songs that she sang for the emperor. One day, the emperor of Japan sent a gift to the emperor of China that came in a heavily jeweled golden box. A parade of servants with a letter that had the seal of the emperor of Japan delivered the present. The emperor of China read the letter from the Japanese emperor. He then opened the box and inside he saw a mechanical bird encrusted with jade and rubies. On the side of the bird was a dial that you could wind up just like how you would a clock. Curious about what the dial would do, the emperor turned it. Much to his delight, the metal bird sang. It sounded just like the real nightingale. When the metal bird had finished, he turned the dial again. And, like the last time, the metal bird sang. The emperor was so happy that he could hear the metal nightingale sing any time he wanted, unlike the real one that only sang for him once a day. The Chinese emperor, delighted with the gift, sent his diplomat with a letter, boxes of jade, and fine silk to the Japanese emperor to express his thanks. Later that day, the nightingale flew to the palace to sing a song to the emperor. But when she arrived, she saw that there was already a metal bird in her place. The emperor didn't notice the nightingale because he was preoccupied with his newfound toy. The nightingale was very sad that the emperor had forgotten her and their friendship. So she flew back to her home in the woods and left the emperor with the metal bird. The emperor treated the metal bird as if it was real, and he put it on top of the perch made for the real nightingale. The emperor wound the metal bird several times a day, and each time it played the same music. The citizens listened to the same tune again and again. They memorized every note that came from the metal bird. One beautiful morning, when the emperor woke up, he ordered the metal bird to his royal chamber. He wished to hear it sing. He wound it up like he always did, but this time, instead of the usual whir of the gears turning, the emperor heard before it sang, he listened to a buzzing sound instead. Whir, whir, buzz, buzz. Nothing happened. No music came out of the metal bird. The situation deeply upset the emperor, and he immediately summoned the royal mechanic to fix the bird. The royal mechanic came looking sleepy, but he forced himself to look alert as he entered the emperor's chambers. This mechanical bird is not singing as it should. Fix it, the emperor exclaimed. The mechanic got scared of seeing the emperor upset, as he rarely got angry. He then swiftly took out his tools and examined the bird, because he didn't want to be at the receiving end of the emperor's anger. Sweat formed on his brows, as he tried to understand and repair the bird. Finally, after a few hours of tinkering, he brought the mechanical bird to the emperor. Is it fixed? 
the emperor asked. Yes, your majesty. But the gears inside the mechanical bird are brittle and overused. The bird can play music, but not as often as before. Perhaps only once a week. If we go beyond this, the gears will break, and the bird will never play music again, the mechanic answered. This news deeply saddened the emperor, as he had gotten used to listening to the bird's song every day. Thank you for your hard work. If this is the situation, then you must pay close attention to the bird and make sure that it is in top condition. The emperor ordered the mechanic. I will do as you command, your majesty. The royal mechanic replied, bowing low. In the days and weeks that followed, the royal mechanic tried his best to keep the motorized bird singing. But soon, the gears inside the bird became unrepairable, and it became so fragile that it could only play music once a month under the supervision of the mechanic. The emperor grew sadder and sadder every day. Without the nightingale's music to keep his spirits up, this sadness made his body weak, and eventually he got sick. It confused the royal physicians what kind of disease had gotten hold of the emperor, because all their tests proved he had no disease that was keeping him ill. Despite the physicians' best efforts, the emperor grew weaker and weaker, until all he could do was lie on his bed and stare out his window. The doctors knew that it wouldn't be long before the angel of death would visit the emperor. The people in China were so sad, and they all wished hard that their beloved emperor would get well. That night, when the moon was full, the emperor lay on his bed, pale and weak. Although the physicians didn't say it, deep down, they knew that the inevitable was coming. So he lay down on his silk pillows, closed his eyes, and waited. He closed his eyes and heard a rustle in his window. He thought it was the angel coming to take him. But instead, he heard a familiar chirp. His heart started to beat a little faster and stronger. With all his strength, He opened his eyes and saw the nightingale perched outside his bedroom window. She had heard that the emperor was very ill, and she had come to see and cheer him up. He managed a small smile. My friend, forgive me for abandoning you, he said, tears flowing from his eyes. The nightingale didn't say anything but sang a sweet and melodious tune. With every note, the emperor felt his strength come back, little by little. When it was finished, as if by magic, the song restored the emperor's health. There is nothing to forgive, as I forgave you a long time ago, the nightingale said to the emperor. Please live in the palace and sing for me again. I promise that from now on, nothing will ever replace you. The emperor implored. I cannot live in the palace because my home is in the forest. But every day, I will come and sing for you. For as long as you want me to. The nightingale said. Then... Let it be so. I will wait to hear you sing to me every day. The emperor said to the bird, delighted that she had forgiven him. The nightingale then flew back to her home in the woods. 
and the emperor had the most restful sleep that he ever had in his life. The next day, his chief servant Kang entered the room, expecting to find the emperor lifeless. But, to his surprise and delight, he found the emperor looking out of the window, fully dressed in his imperial robes. Kang was shocked and delighted. The emperor miraculously healed. He wasted no time to call the rest of the emperor's court to tell them the good news. The emperor's entire court, dressed in funeral attire, rushed and crowded inside the emperor's room to see if the news was real. Their jaws dropped at the sight of the emperor standing up and in full health. What kind of miracle happened last night? The emperor, amused at the sight of his entire court trying to fit themselves into his room, smiled at them and said, It's a beautiful morning. What are you all standing there for? There are a lot of things that need doing. And with this, his entire court scurried out of the room and prepared to do their duties. The people all over China heard of the emperor's miraculous recovery, and they celebrated their emperor's new lease in life. They danced and made paper lanterns and chanted the emperor's name. The nightingale made good with her promise, and she flew to the emperor's castle every day to sing for him. The emperor had the mechanical bird destroyed into pieces. It would never again replace the real nightingale. Everything returned to what it was before, and, as with every story, the emperor and everybody else lived happily ever after. I hope that you enjoyed listening to the story. Good night, and see you again next time. Welcome to Soothing Pods Sleep Stories. My name is Chris, and today I would like to help you relax and fall asleep, guided by my voice and the story you are about to hear. Tonight, I will tell you a story about a boy named Jack, and how he climbed a magic beanstalk, and took back a golden harp and a hen who laid golden eggs. But, before we begin our journey, settle in comfortably in your bed. Now, close your eyes, breathe in through your nose, Exhale through your mouth. Feel your body relax as you breathe in and out. Continue to breathe in and out. One more time. Breathe in. Breathe out. I hope that you are completely relaxed and ready to listen to the story. Once upon a time, in a small country cottage, a few hours' walk from town, there lived a widow and her son Jack. Jack and his mother owned a small farm where they planted vegetables to eat and sometimes sold it in the nearby market. Jack often helped his mother tend to the farm. He chopped wood watered the plants, and milked Bessie, their only cow. Jack and his mother lived a hard life, but they always had enough to eat. One day, a famine swept through the land, and everybody, including Jack and his mother, had a hard time getting enough food to eat. Sometimes, they didn't have any food, one night, 
After a hard week, Jack's mother asked him to take their cow Bessie to the town market and sell her. Jack, take the cow to the market tomorrow and try to get a good price for her. I'm not happy that we have to sell Bessie, but if we are to survive this famine, we have no choice, Jack's mother said. Yes, mother, Jack answered as he went to sleep with his stomach rumbling. Early the next day, after a breakfast of plain, watery porridge, Jack prepared Bessie to go to town with him. He brushed the cow and made sure that she was clean and looked her best. Don't worry, Bessie. I will find you a good owner who will take good care of you, he said as he patted her nose. He then took the cow's halter and opened their rusty gate and went on the road to town. Jack whistled while he walked. He smiled at the thought of the wonderful food and beautiful fabric that he could buy with the money he'll get for the cow. Jack was halfway to town when he met a strange-looking older man. The man wore mismatched clothes and had no shoes on. He had a scraggly white beard that reached up to his chest, and on his unkempt grey hair was a pointy hat. Hello there, he said, waving to Jack. Hello, Jack answered, stopping to talk to the older man. What a lovely cow. Where are you taking this fine cow? The old man asked, petting Bessie's head. I'm off to town market to get the best price for her, Jack answered. The old man ran his fingers through his beard and said, Is that so? Listen, lad, I rarely do this, but seeing that you are an outstanding man, I'll give you this once-in-a-lifetime offer. The older man's offer intrigued Jack. What could the bedraggled man offer him in exchange for the cow? How much will you give me for Bessie? Jack asked. Not how much, but what? The old man said as he put his hand in his pocket. He pulled out three colored beans in red, yellow, and blue. Jack laughed. Those are just beans, old man. Why would you think that you can pay for a cow with beans? The old man looked at Jack and said, Ah, but these are not ordinary beans. He paused for effect. They're magic. Jack's eyes widened in excitement at the mention of magic beans. He cleared his throat and said, Very well, old man. You got yourself a deal, he said, handing over the cow's halter to the old man. But you better not be fooling me, or else you must return the cow. Oh, if the beans are not magic, I'll be more than happy to return the cow, the old man said as he walked away with the cow. He whistled happily as his figure disappeared from Jack's view. Jack looked at the three magic beans in his hand and thought that today must be his lucky day. He quickly ran home. He couldn't wait to show his mother the seeds. His mother was cleaning the house when he arrived. It surprised her to see him as she wasn't expecting him to be home until the late afternoon. Jack, you're home early. I'm so happy that you sold Bessie quickly. We need all the money we can get so we can get through this difficult time. Now tell me, how much did you sell our cow for? His mother said to him. Well, I didn't sell Bessie, 
I traded her, Jack said to his mum. You traded her? For what? His mother asked. For these, Jack answered as he opened his hands to show the three magic beans. His mother's face turned red and her eyebrows knitted together when she saw the three beans in his hands. How could you even think that these beans are magic? That old man was lying. There are no such things as magic beans, she said, as she lost her temper with her son. She then took the beans from his hands and threw them out the window. They didn't talk much for the rest of the day, and when the night came, they both had supper of the same watery porridge that they have been having for the last few days. Jack and his mother went to bed, sad and disappointed. Of the two, Jack felt worse because he blamed himself for what had happened. If only I weren't such a fool, none of this would have happened, Jack told himself as he cried himself to sleep. The moon was full that night, and when Jack and his mother were fast asleep, The beans grew magically under the moonlight. They grew and grew and grew until they reached high above the clouds. The beanstalk was as thick as their house and its massive size occupied almost all of their farm. The strange old man was right. They were magic beans. When Jack and his mother woke up the next morning, Their mouths dropped open at the sight of the gigantic beanstalk that grew overnight next to their cottage. Jack, it's magic, his mother said, putting her hands in her mouth in awe. Oh son, I'm so sorry I didn't believe you, his mother apologized. It's okay, mother. It's hard to believe magic beans exist, Jack told his mother. Mother, I will climb the beanstalk to see where it goes. The old man didn't say where it leads, but I'm sure because they are magic, it must lead to somewhere amazing. Jack told his mother. And before his mother could protest, Jack climbed the gigantic beanstalk. Jack climbed higher and higher and higher until he found himself above the clouds. When he looked down, his house was just the size of a key. Jack wanted to find out what lay at the end of the beanstalk. So, he continued to climb through the clouds. After what felt like hours, Jack finally reached the end of the beanstalk, and He found himself in a place that looked like where he lived, except everything was ten times bigger. He stepped off the beanstalk and saw that the grass was ten feet high and that even the insects were bigger than him. Could it be that I'm in the kingdom of the giants? He thought to himself as he walked through the high grass. He remembered that his father used to tell him stories of a kingdom full of giants, high above the clouds. He couldn't remember much, and wished that he had paid more attention to the story. But, from what he could piece together, there was a giant who lived in a castle, where he had chests upon chests of gold and precious gems. He wasn't sure how to find this castle, but he figured that if he walked far enough, he would eventually find it. Sure enough, after a while, he saw a big castle in the distance, and he hurriedly ran towards it. He was out of breath when he finally reached the castle door. He looked up 
and saw that the door handle was much too high and too big for him to hold and push. He looked from where he was standing and saw that there was a crack in the door, big enough for him to go inside. Jack squeezed himself in and found himself inside a large room. Everything was ten times his size. The furniture, the walls, and the food that lay on the big table in the center of the room. Jack's stomach growled at the sight of the delicious food. So, without giving it much thought, he climbed the table and helped himself to some cake and bread on the table. He ate and ate and ate until he was full. But the food was so big that it looked like he hadn't touched it at all. Suddenly, Jack heard thundering footsteps from a distance. Surely, it must be the giant who owns this place. He quickly went down from the table and tried to find a place where he could hide. The only place that he could see was a big crack in the wall. He quickly crouched inside it, praying that the hole he was hiding in wasn't a rat's home. The door handle turned, and in came a smelly giant with a big nose, crooked teeth, and scraggly matted black hair. The giant closed the door behind him, but the door didn't close all the way. He threw the axe that he was carrying on the floor, and it made a loud sound as it hit the marble. The giant then walked towards the table, but stopped mid-step and sniffed the air. Fee-fi-fo-fum, I smell the blood of an Englishman. Be he alive or be he dead, I'll grind his bones to make my bread. Jack shook where he was hiding, and didn't even dare to breathe. Suddenly, a giant rat scurried across the floor. Oh, it's only a rat, the giant roared. Jack breathed a silent sigh of relief, and vowed to be kinder to the rats if he ever gets home alive. The giant was disappointed that what he thought was a human turned out to be just a rat, and so he sat down to eat his supper. After he ate his fill, he moved the food with one hand to one side of the table. He stood up, went to another room, and came back with ten brown sacks which he put on the table. Jack's eyes widened as he saw that the sacks were all filled with gold coins. The giant then poured all the gold coins from the sacks on the table and counted them one by one. It wasn't long before the giant's eyes grew heavy with all the counting. He put his head in his hands and fell asleep. Jack looked at the giant and waited until he was snoring, just to be sure that the giant was fast asleep, before he came out of his hiding place. He hurriedly climbed the table, careful not to make any noise or sudden movements that might wake the giant. When he was safely on the table, he tiptoed his way to the pile of gold coins and slowly took one discarded bag, which was the size of a sack for someone his size, and filled it with as many gold coins as he could carry. He hurriedly went down the table, carrying the big sack of gold on his shoulders. 
He then went through the door left ajar and ran to the beanstalk as fast as his scraggly legs could carry him. When he reached the beanstalk, he tied the sack tightly and threw it down. After a few minutes, he heard a loud thud as the bag landed on his farm. He then slid down the beanstalk, and within a few minutes, he was safely back down. His mother was the first face that greeted him when he went down the beanstalk. She had heard something fall from the beanstalk, and she ran to see if he was back. Jack, thank goodness you are back safe. I was so worried. Come here and give your mother a long hug, she said as she embraced Jack tightly. Jack then told his mother the story of the giant and the castle, and then took the sack with gold. He showed the bag full of gold coins to his mother. Jack and his mother lived well after that. They fixed the farm and bought new seeds, and they purchased farm animals that they can take care of. They even bought a new cow. Life was good for both of them. Jack heard from his neighbor, who heard from somebody else, the story of a giant who lived up in the clouds and owned a magic harp and a hen who laid golden eggs. His neighbor laughed while he told the story, but Jack knew that it was true. He had been there. Jack became restless and felt that he had to go up the beanstalk again to see for himself if the story was true. His mother protested, but he reassured her and said, Mother, I promise that this will be the last time I go up the beanstalk. I'll take the axe and wait for me here. When I come back, let's chop the beanstalk down. His mother thought for a while and finally agreed to his condition. Very well, do what you have to do and come back, his mother said. And so, Jack climbed the beanstalk again, this time with a full stomach and a renewed vigor. He climbed the beanstalk quickly, and when he arrived, he ran to the castle. The crack in the door was still there, and he pushed himself inside the door just as he did the last time. The giant was not home, so Jack searched for the harp and the hen who laid golden eggs. He went from room to room, but he found nothing. So he went to the hole in the wall where he went before and waited for the giant. If he were lucky, the giant would take the harp and the hen. Jack was hiding for a few hours in the mouse hall, and he felt his muscles aching from crouching for so long. There was still no sign of the giant. Just as he thought of giving up, he heard the door open. The giant has arrived. Just as before, the giant feasted on the food that was on the table. When the giant finished eating, he took a golden key from his pocket and opened a secret hiding place behind a painting. From the drawer, the giant took a golden harp and a plain-looking hen that looked like any other hen that he had on the farm. The giant gently laid the harp and the hen on the table in front of him. Lay, he commanded to the hen. And just like that, the hen laid a golden egg. 
The giant asked the hen to lay eggs several times until he had a little pile in front of him. Satisfied, the giant then turned his attention to the golden harp. Play, he said. The harp's strings then moved by themselves, and beautiful music played from it. It lulled the giant to sleep. Soon enough, he snored. Jack saw his chance and slowly came out of the hole where he was hiding. He swiftly climbed the table and slowly tiptoed to where the hen and the golden harp was. He slowly took the hen with one hand and, with his other hand, the magic harp which he securely tucked under his arm. He then climbed down and hurriedly tiptoed to the door. But, alas, he tripped, and the harp fell from his arm and made a loud noise as it hit the ground. The noise woke the giant up, and when he saw that Jack had his precious hen and his golden harp with him, he let out a roar that shook the castle. Give me my hen and my harp back. The giant screamed as he ran after Jack. Jack ran as fast as his legs could carry him with the hen and the golden harp. The giant was big, but he was slow and Jack was already sliding down the beanstalk, while the giant was only halfway to where he was. When Jack reached the ground, he shouted for his mother. Mother, the axe, quickly, he shouted to his mother. She came running towards him with the axe in hand. The beanstalk was shaking as the giant made his way down. He was still yelling in anger, and each time he screamed, it shook the entire countryside. Jack wasted no time and chopped the beanstalk with all his might, and with every swing of his axe, the beanstalk grew closer and closer to tumbling down. With the final blow of Jack's axe, The beanstalk fell, taking with it the giant. With this, the giant disappeared forever. Jack heaved a sigh of relief, and when he had recovered from his ordeal, he showed his mother the golden harp and the hen that laid golden eggs. Between the golden harp that played beautiful music and the hen that laid golden eggs. Jack and his mother lived a happy and prosperous life. It wasn't long before Jack married and had children, and when his children had children, he often told them the story of the giant and the beanstalk. His grandchildren laughed at his story, They told him that giants and magic beanstalks don't exist. Jack, now an older man, smiled because he knew, as we know now, the real story. I hope that you've enjoyed this story. Sleep tight, and see you again next time. Hello. And welcome to Soothing Pods Sleep Stories. Tonight, I will tell you the story of the twelve dancing princesses, and transport you to a land of magic and royalty. Before we begin the story, let's take a moment to relax and find comfort in the space we are in, here and now. Close your eyes gently and allow your body to find a natural, comfortable position. 
allow your body to lie down as it pleases, and then allow it to guide you to a restful place. Feel your body as it settles into the plush mattress around you. How wonderful is it to just lay here with your eyes closed in the warmth of the blankets and pillows that surround you simply to comfort you. Listen closely to the soundscape around you. It may be the drone of the cars or the chirp of crickets. Perhaps it's even the pitter-patter of rain or snow as it dances across your roof. Whatever noise it may be, give yourself a few moments to truly listen to it. Can you find the rhythm in the noise? This is the soundtrack to your sleep. Imagine this noise as a small blue line. As the noise ebbs and flows, visualize its cadence moving like a wave. Is your line a gentle slope? Perhaps it's many hills and valleys or even just a small arc. Whichever it may be, follow this line as you feel it pulling you closer and closer to relaxation. Now that you've found peace in the space you are in, let us begin. Far, far within the greenery of Scotland, nestled cosily between miles of rolling hills, there lies a kingdom of beauty and tranquility. The kingdom is surrounded by waterfalls that seem to pour from the heavens. Here, the flowers have bloomed all year for centuries and centuries. Some say there is magic in the soil, while others simply believe they have found the most beautiful land on earth. It is in this kingdom that a benevolent king worked to raise his twelve daughters. Unfortunately, the king was destined to nurture his twelve daughters alone after the loss of his beloved wife. Fearing he would lose them to the young men of the community, the king locked his daughters in their bedroom every night, hoping to shake them of their desire to prance through the city once the sun had set and the dangers had arisen. For years, it seemed as though his plan had worked. Every night, his daughters climbed the long, winding staircase to their opulent bedroom, where they would curl up for the night. The king was rather proud of himself. He felt as though he had found a way to protect his daughters and maintain the ladylike behavior required of a princess. One morning, the king awoke as the sun was rising. He watched from his high tower as the kingdom was bathed in the orange morning light. He found his mind drifting to his past wife. He could almost see her gossamer figure dancing in the garden just below the tower. Touched by the reminder of his wife, he journeyed up to his daughter's room, eager to greet the day with his beloved children. When he reached the bedroom door, he couldn't help but notice that the princess's slippers didn't look pristine. They were dotted with lines of dirt 
and flecks of gold sparkles that glistened in the light streaming through the window. It almost looked as if his daughters had been dancing. For many mornings in a row, the king discovered the same thing. His daughter's shoes seemed to get more scuffed every night that passed. Though he asked his daughters why their shoes were in disarray, the daughters assured him repeatedly they had not left their room. The king was determined to get to the bottom of the princess's nightly journeys, so determined, in fact, that he told princes far and wide that whoever discovered the secret could have his eldest daughter's hand in marriage. The news travelled through the Scottish Highlands rapidly, like waves dancing across a pond. In a faraway kingdom, a young prince decided he would like to solve the mystery of the princesses. He mounted his horse and rode through a thick, dark forest. Massive pine trees towered above him, casting shadows on the mossy forest floor that seemed to move around him in magical patterns. Up ahead, he could see the warm, welcoming glow of a fire, chilled by the fog and the cold. The prince pulled over to join the keeper of the fire by the flames. The keeper, an elderly man with a beard, handed him a thick cloak. There was a gleam in the elderly man's eyes. With a wink, the elderly firekeeper told the young prince that the cloak would help him solve the mystery of the princesses. Within a few moments, the elderly firekeeper had completely disappeared. The prince pulled the warm cloak over himself and watched as his fingertips disappeared, then his arm, then his torso. The magic illusion crept over his body until he was invisible from head to toe. The prince continued the winding journey through the forest until he arrived in the stunning castle of the kingdom. As the sun began to set on the kingdom, the prince tiptoed up the long spiral staircase to the tippy top of the tower, where the princesses would find rest for the night. He promised the king he would return with the truth of his daughter's nightly adventures. With his cloak on, the prince settled into the corner of the bedroom like a ghost. He watched as the princesses each nestled into their plush, cozy beds. The door closed with a dull thump, and their nighttime ritual began. Each princess rose from their bed, light as a feather. With silent steps, they glided across the wood floor to an intricate rug. At once, all the princesses lifted the heavy, ancient rug, revealing a trap door in the floor. A glowing gold light silhouetted the door. The prince could feel his heart pitter-patter with the mystery of what glorious things could lie under the floorboards. One by one, the princesses filed down the staircase within the trap door. The prince followed close behind, his fingers trailed along the mossy stone wall as he stepped deeper and deeper into the earth, down the long staircase. The princesses began to sing gently and beautifully, in harmony with one another, as if they were meant to sing by each other's side. The princesses filled the stone stairwell with the sweet melody of their voices. The prince felt a warmth begin to trickle through his body, like honey flowing through his veins. His face flushed as he took in the soothing sound of the princess's voices. When they finally entered the cavern, the prince stared at the space around them in awe. Though the top of the cavern was jagged rocks, the floor was dotted with dozens of bright, glowing trees. 
The birch tree's trunk looked like any other, a tiger pattern of dark brown and stark white. But the leaves of the birch trees stopped the prince's heart. The leaves were made of silver, real, genuine silver. A low, fragrant breeze seemed to whisk through the cavern. The silver leaves began to brush against one another, filling the cave with a high, soft chime. The princesses continued to sing, their melody only strengthened by the welcomed percussion of millions of silver leaves flitting against one another in the wind. The prince glanced up to the top of the cavern, where little slivers of moonlight peeked in through holes in the ceiling that sparkled like stars. He began to wonder how such a beautiful place could exist below the castle. The princesses began to cross a small, clear river. They hopped from mossy rock to mossy rock, crisscrossing their way over the babbling brook. The prince followed behind them as they hopped their way through a long, dark tunnel. When they emerged into the next room, the prince could hardly breathe at the sight of the landscape before him. A swirling, gorgeous path winded through a small bog. Massive willow trees hung over the water, swaying lightly in the breeze. Thousands of fireflies drifted through the grotto, illuminating the granite walls in their ethereal glow. Their golden light seemed to warm the entire cave. As the prince inched closer, he realized the leaves of the willow trees were actually thin, gold flakes. In the light of the fireflies, the willow trees glowed and swayed like a calm fire. The prince trailed behind the princesses as he gazed in awe at the gleaming trees all around him. Passing further in the bog, he arrived in yet another cavern. Far, far removed from the glowing fires of the willows, this room was a winter wonderland. Pine trees as tall as the ceiling sparkled with leaves made of luminescent diamonds. Diamond dust at their feet shifted and reflected like snow with every step they took. The ceiling was a stunning mosaic of light and shadow that shifted with every gust of wind. Ahead of the prince, the princesses hurried to a boat at a lake's edge. As the prince settled into the rickety boat, a strong gust of wind crossed the cavern. His cape latched onto the passing breeze and floated off his shoulders just as the boat departed shore. The twelve princesses looked upon him with shock. Realizing why he was there, the eldest daughter begged him not to tell her father of their journey. If the prince would only join them, he would see why this was so important. The prince made no promises, though he was desperate to join them to their final destination. The girls began to row slowly. Silver water dripped, dripped, dripped down from the lofty stalactites. The water coursed down over the prince's skin, chilling him. As they all continued to row, warm lights began to reflect on the water. In the distance, light and laughter poured from a stunning stone castle. Once they reached the shore, the eldest daughter took the prince by the hand. Her touch was gentle and encouraging, leading him into the ballroom of this magical castle. The ballroom dripped with opulence. Chandeliers swung as dozens of people dressed to the nines danced. When the princesses began to dance, the world seemed to slow down. Each of the beautiful princesses moved with enough grace to bring a tear to your eye. 
It was as though they were dancing to a soundtrack of life. Each movement conveyed emotion, warmth, and catharsis. Without hesitation, the prince believed wholeheartedly that the princesses were meant to be here. They were meant to be dancing. The prince joined the eldest daughter in her dancing and felt warmth spread through his entire body. By her side, he felt like he could do anything, like he could dance forever. For hours, they were all lost in movement and music that seemed to breathe on its own. When the eldest daughter tugged on the prince's sleeve, he almost didn't want to leave this beautiful place behind. They began their long journey back to the castle, over the silver lake, through the forests of gold, silver, and diamond. As they walked up the stairs back to reality, the prince felt a tug at his heart. He had been smitten by the eldest daughter. He had seen such an incredible hidden world, and if he revealed that to the king, he would have her hand in marriage and the opportunity to visit the world whenever he pleased. But the prince was uncertain. As the prince went back into the castle, he cast a final look over his shoulder. The king awaited him at the door, eager to hear where his daughters had gone. With a shrug, the prince told the king he wasn't able to discover the mystery of the twelve princesses. Teeming with trust and appreciation, the eldest daughter rushed to the prince's side, telling her father she would like to be wed to him. With his silence, the twelve dancing princesses and the caverns beneath the castle would remain a joyful secret. In their wedding ceremony, the prince and the eldest daughter performed one of the most beautiful dances the kingdom had ever seen. It was almost as if they had magic on their side. A magic secret, indeed. I hope you've enjoyed this story and have found a peaceful night's sleep. Please, join me again tomorrow for another sleep story. Welcome to Soothing Pod Sleep Stories. My name is Laura, and I am going to tell you a wonderful story that will lull you into a peaceful and restful sleep. Tonight, I will tell you how Hansel and Gretel got lost in the woods and discovered a gingerbread house that was owned by a witch. But before we join Hansel and Gretel on their journey, Let's make sure that we are ready. Make yourself comfortable in your bed. The lights are dim and the temperature in the room is just right. Now close your eyes and slowly breathe in through your nose and breathe out through your mouth. One more time. Breathe in and out. You are now ready to listen to the story. Once upon a time in a small cottage built on a clearing leading to a forest, lived a woodcutter, his wife, and their two children named Hansel and Gretel. Hansel, the older of the two, was intelligent and charming, while his sister Gretel was poetic, cautious, and clever. The two loved each other as siblings should, and spent a lot of time in each other's company. They would run around in the field and pick flowers, or play in the nearby lake, throwing pebbles on the water. For a few years, everything went well for the family, but one day, their mother got sick with a mysterious illness. The woodcutter did everything he could do to save his wife, but unfortunately, 
despite all the efforts, she passed away. The untimely passing of his wife overcame the woodcutter with grief. Hansel and Gretel were very sad, but they took comfort in the belief that their mother was in a better place. Two years passed and the woodcutter decided that he needed to be practical. Although he loved his wife dearly, he had to accept the fact that he needed help to raise his two children. And so, he set off to find a new wife, and soon remarried. His new wife was stern, calculated, and cold-hearted. Although she tolerated the children, it was clear from the start that she didn't particularly take a liking to them. She often wished that it was only the woodcutter and her. The family lived well for a few years. Although the family was poor, they always scraped enough food to have three meals a day and provide for their basic needs. However, their peaceful way of life was shaken when a famine enveloped the land. There was little or no food to eat. It became a problem for everyone especially the woodcutter and his family. No matter how much the woodcutter tried to fish or hunt for food, his efforts always turned out to be in vain. Sometimes they couldn't afford even a single meal. The situation went from bad to worse, until late one night, their stepmother, who panicked about running out of food and starving to death, had a serious talk with the woodcutter. Husband, since the children are already asleep, I want to talk to you about something important. The famine is getting worse. Every day there is less and less to eat. We are down to our last days of food in this house. And if we don't do something, we will starve to death, she cried. What do you suggest we do? The woodcutter asked her cautiously. He didn't like where this conversation was heading. Winter is almost here and finding food will be more difficult. Don't you think feeding two heads is better than feeding four? She said. The woodcutter looked at his wife for a long time, his eyebrows coming together in anger. Are you suggesting we get rid of the children? How can you even suggest such a thing? he asked in a low, angry voice. Look, all we need to do is leave the children in the forest, and then after that, it will be only the two of us. Our chances of survival will go up. Feeding two mouths is easier than feeding four, the wife said, raising her voice. I would rather starve than get rid of the children. I never want you to talk about this again the woodcutter said, as he stormed out of the cottage in rage. Unknown to both, the children were awake in their bedroom next door and heard everything that their parents were talking about. Oh no, Hansel. Our stepmother wants to get rid of us. What are we going to do? Gretel asked her brother, tears running down her cheeks. Don't cry, Gretel. First off, Father won't allow her to do such a thing. And second, if it happens, I have a plan to make sure we'll be able to come back home safely. Hansel reassuringly said to Gretel. Go back to sleep, he added as he tucked his sister in bed. Gretel, reassured by her brother, quickly fell asleep. Hansel lay wide awake in bed. He didn't have a plan on how to get them home safely but he was confident that he'd eventually come up with one of them when the time comes. And with this thought, he finally fell asleep. One day, their father bid them goodbye to go fishing on the lake that was about a two-day walk from where they lived. He heard that there were a lot of fish in that lake. If this was true, then it could help them in solving their problem with food, at least for a week or two. At the very least, it would stop his wife from rambling on about getting rid of the children. When the woodcutter said goodbye to the children, 
his wife put her plan of getting rid of Hansel and Gretel into motion. She told the children that they all needed to gather firewood from the forest. She asked Hansel and Gretel to get dressed in their warmest clothes. She even gave them one precious loaf of bread that the children knew she was saving for herself to eat. Hansel and Gretel reluctantly got dressed because they knew what their stepmother was planning. Oh, Hansel, what are we going to do? Gretel asked on the verge of tears. Don't worry, Gretel. Everything will be okay, Hansel reassured his sister. Children, hurry up. We have to get to the woods before the sun goes down, their stepmother said as she forcefully pushed them out of the door. Hansel and Gretel were quiet as they followed their stepmother into the deep woods. But unknown to his stepmother, Hansel had crushed the bread that she gave them into crumbs and was dropping them secretly on the forest floor every few metres. His plan was to make a trail that they could follow back to their cottage. When they got to the deepest part of the woods, their stepmother told them to make a fire, sit and wait for her to come back with more firewood. The children eyed their stepmother suspiciously, but they obeyed her and sat in front of the warm fire. It wasn't long before the warmth of fire made the children tired. Their eyelids got heavier and heavier, and before they knew it, they were sound asleep. When they woke up, it was nearly dusk. As the children expected, their stepmother was nowhere to be seen. They were alone in the woods, with only the crackling of the fire and the occasional owl hooting in the background. Hansel, we've never been this late in this part of the woods before. I'm scared, Gretel said as she grabbed her brother's arm. Don't worry, Gretel. On the way here, I dropped some breadcrumbs on the ground. All we need to do is follow the crumbs, and we'll find our way back home, Hansel said confidently. And so they followed the breadcrumbs that Hansel secretly dropped on the forest floor. However, as they walked deeper into the forest, they found that the trail of breadcrumbs had disappeared. Gretel, the trail of breadcrumbs is gone. The birds must have eaten it. Oh, how could I have been so reckless? Hansel said, as cold sweat formed on his forehead. Gretel saw that Hansel was panicking, and truthfully, she was feeling the same way. But she tried to calm herself down, and hoped that her voice wouldn't betray the rising panic she was feeling inside. Hansel, calm down. I'm sure that we can find our way back to our cottage, if we search carefully, she said, surprised that she sounded calm. She took her brother's clammy hands in hers and led the way. She didn't know where she was going, but anywhere is better than where they were right now. She hoped that they could find a clearing soon. After an hour of walking, they felt tired, cold, and hungry. But there was still no sign of the clearing. I think we're lost, Hansel said, crying. Hush, Hansel. Let's keep walking for a bit, and I'm sure that we will eventually find our way out of this forest, Gretel said. Sobbing, Hansel took Gretel's hand, and true enough, after a few more minutes, they came upon a clearing in the middle of the dark, eerie forest. And in the middle of that clearing stood a house made of gingerbread. And on top of the gingerbread were layers upon layers of icing and candies of every shape and size. It was the house of every child's dream. Hansel could hardly believe his eyes, and at first... He thought it was merely hunger that was making him see this wonderful house in front of him. But as he and his sister came closer, they smelled the gingerbread and the sweets that decorated it. His stomach rumbled 
and his mouth watered. He wanted to eat this house. Shouldn't we ask for permission first, before having a piece? Gretel asked Hansel. I'm sure it'll be fine. Don't worry, Hansel told Gretel. And with that, they each broke the edge of a gingerbread window and quickly ate it. One piece became two, three, until Hansel and Gretel ate one huge portion of the gingerbread window. Oh, it tasted so sweet. Just when they were about to swallow the last bite that they took, the door of the cottage creaked open, and out came what looked like a gentle old lady. She looked annoyed at first by the ruckus she heard, but when she saw the two children, a huge smile broke out on her old wrinkly face. Sweet little children, what are you doing out here in the cold? She asked them in a sweet voice. Come inside where you can warm yourselves in front of a fire, she said while motioning for them to follow her inside. Hansel and Gretel were cold, hungry and tired, so they followed the old woman inside her house. Once inside, the old woman made them sit in front of a warm, blazing fire. The warmth felt so wonderful. After that, she made them wash their faces until they were clean and gave them soft, velvety clothes to wear. After getting the children dressed, the old woman led them to a room where she laid them down on beds that had the softest mattress and the most comfortable pillows. The children wanted to stay up so they can enjoy the bed a little more, but as soon as their heads hit the pillows, they immediately fell asleep. Sleep tight, the old woman said, as she turned off the lights and closed the door. The next morning, when they woke up, the children got up from the bed and went out of the room to search for the old woman so they can thank her. Ah, you are up. It's about time, you lazy children. A shrill voice greeted the children. She looked at them with her beady little eyes and long pointy nose that had warts all over it. She wasn't the nice old woman that they thought she was. She was a witch. The sight of the old witch took the children aback. They quickly turned back and ran towards the cottage door to escape. But alas, the witch locked it. There is no escaping your fate, my little sweets, the witch said as she walked towards the children. When she reached them, she grabbed Hansel by the arm and practically lifted him and threw him in a cage that hung on the ceiling. She then turned towards Gretel and said, You make sure that your brother eats well, so that he is nice and fat when I eat him. Now, Go sweep the floor and tend to the fire so you can cook him a meal. Gretel couldn't do anything at that point but follow what the witch wanted. She couldn't run away and leave her brother behind. So she decided that she'll think of a way to get them out of this horrid situation. While she resigned herself to sweeping the floor littered with bones... She racked her brain on what she knew about witches. She read that witches were almost immortal, meaning they practically live forever, have an excellent sense of smell, like that of a dog, can run fast, but they can't see well, and they are not very smart. Fire was the only way to destroy them. Suddenly, Gretel had an excellent idea. She secretly bent down and pocketed a thin bone the size of a finger. All she had to do was to give this bone to Hansel and explain what he had to do. After sweeping the floor and dusting every corner of the house, the witch's cottage 
looked spick and span. Gretel then turned her attention to making food for her brother. She roasted a big chicken and cooked a pot of vegetables. While she was doing all this, she knew the witch was looking at her every move. She put the food on a plate and climbed up a ladder to get to Hansel's hanging cage. While she put the food inside, she whispered to Hansel, The witch will come to check on you. When that happens, take this bone out instead of your hand. Witches are almost blind, so she'll never know, Gretel said to Hansel, while secretly handing him the bone. Hansel nodded, and sure enough, no sooner had he finished his meal than the witch came up the ladder to check on him. Put out your hand so I can measure how fat you've grown, the witch ordered Hansel. But instead of putting out his hand, he put out the bone that Gretel gave him. Oh dear, how thin you are. Well, not to worry, I will fatten you up, the witch said as she went down the ladder. This behaviour went on for a few weeks, until one day the witch grew angry and frustrated that Hansel didn't seem to grow any fatter. Finally, she decided that she could no longer wait for him to fatten up, and that she'll eat him whether he was fat or thin. Gretel, boil some water in the cauldron, and chop some vegetables as well, the witch barked at Gretel. Hansel heard what the witch said, and it alarmed him, and his sister mouthed, Don't worry silently. Gretel knew what the witch was planning, so she deliberately filled the cauldron as slow as she could. She was trying to think of a plan to get them out of this seemingly dire situation. After you've finished filling up the cauldron, put some wood under the oven and light it, the witch told Gretel. She thought since she would eat Hansel, she might as well eat his sister. The witch chuckled to herself at what she thought to be a genius plan. And so, Gretel did as the witch asked slowly. It took her four hours to light the oven and boil the water. At last, everything was ready. Gretel dear, come and help me check if the oven is hot enough, the witch beckoned to Gretel in a sweet voice. Gretel knew what the witch was planning to do, and so she feigned ignorance. Oh, I would love to help you check the oven, but I don't know how to do it. Please, can you show me? Gretel said to the witch, with her innocent, big brown eyes. Goodness, you've been doing this for weeks, and you still don't know? Okay, I'll show you once. And then you do it, the witch said, exasperated. The old witch opened the oven door and stuck her head inside the oven. The moment that the witch did this, Gretel pushed the witch inside the hot burning oven and locked it shut. And that was the end of the wicked witch. From now on, she won't be able to lure any more children with her gingerbread house to eat them. Gretel quickly ran up to Hansel's cage and opened it. Hansel cried in relief. He was finally free. Gretel then ran to the witch's room, where she knew she kept a chest full of jewels and gold under her bed. She pulled it from under the bed, and both she and her brother filled a bag with all the gold and jewellery that they could carry. After that, they ran as fast as they could, far, far away from the witch's cottage. They didn't know how long they ran, but they found themselves in front of their house in the clearing. From afar, they saw a figure of a man who seemed like he was waiting for someone. It was their father. Father, they both screamed as they ran towards his outstretched arms. The woodcutter couldn't believe what he was seeing. 
The children were alive. He had searched far and wide for them, ever since he found out that his wife had left them in the forest. Hansel, Gretel, he screamed, as the children were at last safe in his arms. The three cried and embraced each other for a long time. Hansel and Gretel told their father the entire story of what had happened to them. Their stepmother, the gingerbread house, and the witch who lived there, and how they escaped. They also showed their father the bag of gems and gold that they had with them. Their father looked at the gems and gold and threw it on the ground. My greatest treasure is the two of you, he said, as he held them tight. The children later found out that their father had left their stepmother and had been living alone in their house, waiting for them to come back. And from that moment, the three of them lived happily ever after in the small cottage in the woods. The famine was finally over and they had enough gold and gems to live a comfortable life. When the three of them tried to look for the gingerbread house in the forest, all that they found was a big old tree in the place where the gingerbread house used to stand. The witch disappeared, and they all breathed a big sigh of relief. I hope you've enjoyed this story. Good night, and see you again next time. Hello, and welcome to Soothing Pod. I am Laura, and if you are here today to listen to a dreamy story that will soothe you and comfort you, you are in the right place. Tonight, I have a special bedtime story to tell you before you fall asleep. It is about a little girl who wandered far from home. But before we begin, let's make sure we are still and relaxed so we can fully enjoy the story and imagine that lush forest with all the stunning flowers and magnificent colours. Lie down in whatever way you are most comfortable. Take a big, deep breath in to relax. And then, let all that air out and feel your body relaxing even more. Are you ready now? Let's begin. Once upon a time, on a lovely spring day, a little girl with golden locks and a beautiful doll wandered out into the forest. She only meant to play for a while in the garden. But as she looked out and passed the green hedge, she grew very, very curious. What could be behind the hedge? She wondered. What adventures could be waiting for me inside the forest? And so, she walked, one careful step after the other. She walked and walked, until she could not see the green of her own garden anymore. She walked until she came to the road, crossed it, and was on the other side. It was so lovely and warm in the sunshine that she decided to go further. She could see the tall fir trees, how they made a cool shade a little way off, and she wanted to go over there. 
she also saw the different colours of the flower bushes in the distance and decided that those flowers were far more beautiful than the ones in her garden. And because this girl, whom we shall call Goldilocks, did not think that her mother would be home for a while, she decided to keep on walking down to the forest. At first, a little thought came to her. What if I get lost? But then, she had another brighter idea. To keep her eyes on the main road and stay along this road. To not go too deep into the forest. And this way, she thought she could always find the path back home. She clutched her little doll closer to her chest and followed the light of the afternoon sun. When she reached the edge of the forest, it was shady and cool, just as she had imagined. She spied little mushrooms immediately, the kind that she knew were good to eat. How pleased mother would be if I collected them for supper, she thought, and began to hunt for more. Goldilocks did not notice that while searching for more mushrooms, she had gone much deeper into the forest than she was supposed to. And when she looked up and realised it was getting quite dark, she began to be a tiny bit afraid. What if she really did get lost? What if Mama came home and found the garden empty? What if the family had supper without her? And what if nobody ever came to look for her? Oh, these were not very nice thoughts. And so Goldilocks decided to try to put them all quite far from her mind. Do stop thinking aloud all these terrible things she said aloud, to herself, and to her doll. The doll could not hear her, of course, but the little girl liked to pretend that it did. You see, she had no brothers or sisters. The doll was her only companion, day after day. It was like a friend, you could say. To keep her mind off those thoughts, she decided to pick more flowers. They grew everywhere in the forest. Tiny yellow ones and larger red ones. Flowers with long stems and flowers with leaves bigger than her face. But it was getting very dark now. And soon even the colours of the flowers seemed to be fading. How dark it is here. I cannot see the road. Maybe I am really lost now, said Goldilocks. Oh, my dear little dolly, I'm glad you are with me. And just then, Goldilocks thought she heard her doll reply. Yes, perhaps we are lost. Don't be afraid. Let's be brave together. Goldilocks smiled. Yes, you are right, dear Dolly. There is nothing to be afraid of. Dolly held her hand tighter. I will be a good friend to you and help you get home. Goldilocks thought she saw something in the distance. Look. What is that? she called. Dolly shook her head. I cannot see anything. Something is moving in the distance. Maybe it is a bear, said Goldilocks. 
Dolly shuddered. Oh dear, please don't say that. It is not a nice thought. I don't like bears. I really hope it is not a bear. They walked on a few steps more, and then came to a tiny little house. It was so small, and so cute. Goldilocks thought it might be a dollhouse. It was the perfect size after all. She went to the door and had a look. The door was tiny, too. Not big enough for her father to fit, and not big enough for her mother, either. The door was just the right size for her and Dolly. Isn't it a funny little house? she asked Dolly. Let's look inside. It makes me wonder who lives here in the woods. Goldilocks was her usual curious self. But Dolly was not sure about this. Dolly put her arms across her chest in protest. Oh, Goldilocks, please, don't you think it is better and safer if we just look for the path home? This seems like a very strange house. What kind of strange creature would have a tiny house in the woods? Well, it could be any kind of creature. Perhaps a kind one, and a gentle one. Perhaps a fairy creature. Maybe a kind and gentle fairy family lives here. Perhaps, said Dolly. Or it might be a wicked witch who will take us for her supper. Goldilocks laughed at Dolly and told her to be quiet. You know, you shouldn't say such terrible things. In fact, Dolly, you should not even think about them. And anyway, we don't taste that good. Not good enough for anyone's supper. Dolly didn't seem convinced. Well, maybe not supper, maybe breakfast. Goldilocks frowned at her doll. Oh, come on, dear Dolly. Let's just look through the window, and maybe we will see a clue. Maybe someone inside has a phone, and we can call home to Mummy and Daddy. Or maybe they can at least tell us the way to get home. Let's just have a look, shall we? Goldilocks went over to the window and tried to peer inside. She did not see any creature inside at all, but the lamp was on in the living room and she could smell something that reminded her of her mother's apple pies. Inside it looked so nice and warm, and cosy. Let's go inside. It does not look like anyone is home. But I don't think they will mind a little doll like you, or a little girl like me. At least let's hope they give us something good to eat, answered Dolly. Goldilocks pushed open the door. It was easy to get inside. She closed it, quietly behind her, and looked around the room. There was a fire on the hearth. That delicious scent of something yummy. A table in the centre of the room. Three chairs placed around it, and three bowls, ready for supper. Oh look, what pretty bowls! One, two... Three, said Goldilocks. And there is porridge inside, so that is what smelled so good. I think I will just have a taste. I am so hungry. Goldilocks put Dolly down on the table, so that she could see into the bowls. Then she went over to get a big spoonful of porridge from the first bowl. 
Let me just taste the porridge in the big bowl first. She raised the spoon from the big bowl to her mouth and tried to take a big bite. But it was hot and burned her lips. Goldilocks jumped back in surprise. Oh, Dolly, the porridge in the big bowl is way too hot, she exclaimed. Dolly looked at her as if to say, I told you not to come in here. But instead, what she said was, Oh, Goldilocks, do be careful. Try the next bowl. It is a mid-sized bowl, and pretty too. Maybe it's not so hot. Goldilocks went over to the mid-sized bowl and took a bite. You are right, Dolly. It is not too hot. But oh dear, the porridge in the mid-sized bowl is way too cold. Well, maybe you are being picky now, answered Dolly. You must not be so hard to please. I am so hungry I could eat anything. Hot porridge or cold porridge, it really doesn't matter. Goldilocks pointed to the third bowl. Look at this little bowl, she smiled. It had cute designs painted on it, and was full of porridge too. Goldilocks took a spoonful of porridge from the little bowl and lifted it to her mouth. Oh yes, perfect. The porridge in the little bowl was just right. Sit down, Dolly, and let's have supper together. Dolly sat down a little slowly, unsure of whether she wanted to eat all the porridge after all. She thought it might not be so polite to eat all the porridge without asking whoever cooked it first. Well, Goldilocks, do you really think we should? Do you think it is polite for us to eat all the porridge? Oh, Dolly, if you thought it was not polite to eat it, then you should have spoken up and said something before I took the first bite. But now, we have taken bites out of all the bowls, so we might as well go ahead and finish the porridge. Dolly started to look very tired just now. Don't you think we'd better go home? She said to Goldilocks. Goldilocks was a little disturbed now, with all of Dolly's whining. We could go home if we knew the way, but we don't, Dolly. So we might as well stay here for the night and try to find the way back in the morning. She saw a nice rocking chair in the corner. It looked so cosy and comfy there. You look so tired, Dolly, and I am tired too. Let's just rest a while. What do you say? Before Dolly could say anything, Goldilocks tried to climb into the big rocking chair, but it was too high. She was having a hard time. Oh dear, I can't get into it, she sighed. You had better not move it out of its place, said Dolly. Right, said Goldilocks. Never mind the big one. Look, there is a mid-sized chair. Maybe I should try that one. Dolly was really tired now. Be careful, Goldilocks, she said with a great big yawn. It is better not to move the chairs out of their places. Hmm, the mid-sized chair was not comfy enough. I think I shall try the littlest rocking chair. It seems to be perfect for me. Goldilocks lifted herself into the smallest rocking chair, and she did not even have to struggle. It was just as she had said. Perfect. It was so perfect that Goldilocks felt like singing a song. So that is just what she did. Much to Dolly's delight, who was not feeling quite so frightened anymore. And the little song that the little girl with the beautiful golden curls, sang. 
went something like this. rock a dolly in the treetop. When the wind blows, the cradle will rock. When the bow breaks, the cradle will fall, and down will come Dolly, cradle and all. Oh, oh, said Dolly, at this last line of the song, because just then, something broke. The chair that Dolly was sitting on broke. Not because it was too big or too little, but just because Goldilocks had rocked it a little too hard. Now, Goldilocks felt sorry, because it was just as the song went. The cradle came down, and so did her baby doll. Dear Dolly, cried Goldilocks. Oh dear, I am sorry for rocking you so hard. Are you hurt, dear Dolly? At the thought that she could have hurt her doll, Goldilocks began to cry a little. But Dolly, the good friend that she was, comforted her well. Don't cry, dear Goldilocks, she said. Maybe you are just tired because it is already so late. Let's go to the bedrooms and see what we can find there. Maybe a nice, comfy bed to settle in for the night. This sounded like a good idea. They walked over to the bedroom from the table, and there they found a nice and warm place. It had three beds in it. One very big bed, one very small bed, and one that was just mid-sized. Dolly held Goldilocks' hand and showed her the beautiful big bed. It had nice blue plush covers, blue pillows that reminded her of the sky, and was quite high off the ground. Oh, see the big bed? Isn't it lovely? said Dolly. Goldilocks agreed. It was such a nice big bed. She felt like falling asleep in it right away. So, Goldilocks placed Dolly on the big bed and then climbed in after her. Goldilocks yawned and stretched her arms high. Oh, Dolly, she murmured. I'm so tired and I don't have my toothbrush with me tonight. But surely... One night is okay to go without bathing or brushing. What would Mama say? I'm sure she will forgive me just this once, so I'll just climb in and go to sleep. But the little girl realised that she didn't actually like the big bed. It was not as comfy as the one at home. Oh no, she sighed again. I don't like it. This big bed is too hard. Dolly pointed to the mid-sized one, so Goldilocks went over to it to test it out. But it was too soft, she thought. No, this won't do, Dolly. This mid-sized one is too soft, she said. Goldilocks went next to the smallest bed. And what do you suppose she found out there? that it was just the right size. Not too big, and not too little. Not too hard, and not too soft. Oh yes, this little one is just right, she finally smiled. Now let's go to sleep, Dolly. But before Dolly could answer, Goldilocks was already snoring, fast asleep, and on her way to dreamland. A few hours later, there was some movement at the door. It was the Bear family, back from their walk in the woods. Dolly heard them as they turned the doorknob and entered their home. Wasn't that a fun time we had, playing in the woods? 
said Mama Bear. Yes, it was, said little Sunny Bear. There were so many berries and mushrooms, and good places to hide in the shady wood. I didn't want to go home yet. I know, said Mother Bear. You were having such a good time, but now you will have a tasty supper and a nice story before sleep. This made Father Bear smile, for he was hungry after having such a long day. Yes, good idea to eat a nice warm supper. It is getting late. Let's hurry to set the table and then go to bed. Sunny Bear agreed. His tummy rumbled and felt as if he could eat a whole bowl of porridge. And the porridge that Mother made was always so delicious. All right, Mother dear, he said, kicking off his shoes. I am so hungry after that long day playing, and your porridge is always so good. I do have dessert for you tonight, Mother Bear promised, as she went to check that all three bowls were full of porridge. We have crunchy, delicious, nice red apples too. Oh, goody, said little Sunny Bear. We bears always like apples, don't we, Papa? Father Bear washed his hands and dried them off with a towel and went over to take his seat at the head of the table. Yes, that's right, my son, he said. Father Bear looked at his chair curiously. It did not seem to be in the same position where he left it. Now that he realised it, Father Bear turned to the door that they had just entered through. Well, Mama Bear, he said, did you notice that when we came in, the door was open? I'm certain I closed it when we went away to the forest. Don't you remember that it was definitely closed? I wonder if someone came into our house. Father Bear looked around the little house suspiciously. But Mother Bear did not want to frighten Sunny Bear. Let's sit down at the table, dear, she suggested. But when they did so, Father Bear immediately noticed that something was not right. Look here. Somebody has been tasting my porridge, he said. Mother Bear looked into his bowl and then into hers. Let me see. Yes, look here as well. Someone has eaten a spoonful of my porridge too. Sunny Bear checked his bowl as well. Oh, Mama, mine too. Someone has eaten all of my porridge, and there is nothing left. Mother Bear shook her head in disapproval. She had worked extra long that day to make sure they had supper ready before going on their walk. And now... It was almost gone. Who has been eating all of our porridge? She said. And who's been moving my chair? Said Father Bear. Mother Bear went over to inspect the chairs. Someone has been sitting in my chair, she said. Sunny Bear examined his chair too. Look, Mother, somebody's been rocking in my chair. But not just that. They have broken it. He began to cry. Don't cry, Sunny Bear, said his papa. I'll make you another chair tomorrow. Mother Bear yawned. This was a very long day indeed. Sunny Bear yawned. Father Bear yawned too. He split his porridge in two portions and gave half to his son. Here you go, he said. Eat up now. I will give you an extra apple since all your porridge was gone and then we will take you to bed. After supper, Father Bear carried the littlest bear on his shoulders up to bed. But as he tried to put his son to bed, he saw his own big bed all dishevelled 
the blankets and pillows out of place. Well, who's been in my bed? said Father Bear. And look at my bed, said Mother Bear. Someone has been lying on my bed. Sunny Bear was getting excited with all of this commotion, but he was even more excited when he looked at his own bed. Someone is in my bed, he said. And what do you suppose happened then? Well, Goldilocks opened her eyes when she heard the three bears chatting. Dolly opened her eyes too. Everyone looked at each other in surprise, and before they could say anything at all, Goldilocks had jumped out of bed with Dolly in her hands and ran out the door. She ran and ran until she found the main road and ran and ran until she reached her home. Until this day, nobody knows exactly how Goldilocks got home, but you can imagine how happy her mother was when she showed up at the door. As for the little sunny bear, he finally closed his eyes, tucked his chin under his covers, and went to sleep. And now, it's time for you to drift off into dreamland too. I hope you've enjoyed this story of the woods, and I hope you'll be back tomorrow for more. Good night. Hello and welcome to Soothing Pod Sleep Stories. Tonight, I will be your guide on this journey to a peaceful sleep. The day is done and you deserve to rest. It is time to let go of all the worries on your mind, all the to-do list items done or undone, and all your plans for tomorrow. They can wait. Now you should stretch and sigh. Let a deep breath in and out. And settle into the comfort of your bed. As you listen, wiggle the tension from your fingertips. Relax the palms of your hands and let the feeling of softness travel slowly up your arms, over your shoulders, to your chest. Another breath in, and as you exhale, let any tightness around your heart fall away. No more calls, no more conferences, no more stress. Just the story of a small wooden horse and the magic carved into it nearly 200 years ago. Far in the north of the world stretch the ancient pine forests of Sweden. Yes, the winters are bitter and cold, but the towering trees catch the snow and their needles are evergreen. It is quiet below the immense pines where their thick boughs stop the breezes and people are few and far between. It is there that a woodcutter once walked, leading his horse deep into the forest, despite the heavy clouds and coming snow. His was hard work with no such thing as a day off, 
and he bore the bone-cold temperatures as best he could. His heavy workhorse helped. It plodded gently next to him, and every now and then, its thick harness would creak, or its buckles would jingle. And the woodcutter would smile and pat the horse's powerful shoulder, his horse's steady breath, sure steps, and gentle brown eyes gave the woodcutter the faith to move forward, no matter what the weather. Together they walked miles and miles through the biting cold, sheltered by his horse's massive neck and braided mane. The woodcutter trekked far into the forest until the perfect pine tree was found. It stood tall in a natural clearing, more magnificent than a cathedral, and the woodcutter knew exactly how many boards could be made from its thick and even trunk. Cut for lumber, that one tree would pay for his family to be fed and warm, and the woodcutter wasted no time in starting his laborious task. His horse stamped his hooves to encourage him, and whinnied in excitement when the timber finally fell. Then the woodcutter bent his saw back to the task of removing all the thick branches, still sticky with sap. It wasn't until the horse snorted that the woodcutter noticed an old traveller had entered the clearing. A white-haired man with twinkling blue eyes nodded hello and the woodcutter's horse bowed his head in return. Trusting his horse's instincts, the woodcutter greeted the old traveller and invited him to sit beside his humble fire. The woodcutter was a man of very few words, but the old traveller didn't mind. He sat comfortably and remembered aloud old stories of pagan times in the pine forests and how the wise and forgotten had once worshipped horses. He reminded the woodcutter how horses were holy symbols of strength and rebirth, how they ploughed the cold fields so the seeds could grow, and then helped bring the bountiful harvest in. The woodcutter agreed with a short and silent nod, knowing full well how his workhorse generously lent him the power he needed to fell the trees and haul them back to the village. Days later, the old traveller's stories still stuck with the woodcutter like sap from the pine tree they hauled. He was grateful for his workhorse's help, and, in his heart, he believed the old man was right about the sacred gift the horse had always bestowed on humans. Thinking of people made the woodcutter miss his family, and the longer he walked, the more he wished to harness the horse's magic, so that his wife and child could also have all the help they needed, even when he was gone. That night, still deep in the forest, the woodcutter sat close to his small fire, and carefully carved a wooden horse from a thick section of pine branch. He gave it his horse's thick neck and sturdy legs. Working hard, despite how bitter the cold bit at his fingertips, and he finally smiled when the small carving's ears pricked forward, just exactly as his horse did when he whistled to it. On the long, cold trek home, the little wooden horse rode in a pocket close to the woodcutter's heart. It answered each heartbeat 
with a gentle nudge, just as his real horse encouraged him along the snowy trail. There, warm under his heavy woolen sweater, the little wooden horse must have heard how the love of family kept the tired man on pace. Slowly over the long miles, it absorbed the love it felt. When the woodcutter finally delivered his haul and made his way to his small cabin on the edge of the village, his child ran to greet him, caught up in his strong arms. The child felt the little wooden horse and wondered at what his father had brought him. Often, it was only a pine cone, so even and beautiful it couldn't be left behind. But this time, it was a glorious gift. The child took the little wooden horse and galloped, laughing up to his mother, who marvelled at the beauty of the natural wood grain. Years later, the little wooden horse stood high on a shelf in a workshop. The woodcutter's child had grown to be a man, and, though he was too old and serious to gallop the little horse around, he still gazed at it fondly every day. It helped him in his work, thinking about how his father had carved it deep in the winter forest, for the small child had grown up to become a furniture maker. It was dusty, meticulous work, and the workshop was very busy, but the little horse was always cleaned and polished. The beauty of its pine grain had a soft glow from many years of friendly hands and happy play. Those that saw it high upon the shelf thought it must have a light of its own. The furniture maker knew it was magic. Long ago on the cold wintry day, his father had returned from the forest. He had gathered up his child and told him the tale of the old traveller. They snuggled up together by the hearth and talked of kind spirits and ancient magic, the lights of which they were sure had helped humankind through the centuries. The warmth of that fire and the faith of that talk had added a spark to the little wooden horse's own heart and love kept it alight. Though sometimes, when the long winter was coming and when money seemed tight, that little glow was hard to see. The furniture maker had a good living in the village, but there were tough times all around. He helped his neighbours by giving them the wood chips from his shop to light their fires and keep them warm. And in return, they sent whatever business they heard of his way. Still, the winter grew long and it was hard to imagine the light would return. The furniture maker's wife was a loving, practical woman, and it was she that suggested he sell the little wooden horse so they would have gifts for their children at Christmas time. He couldn't bear to part with his precious keepsake, so he saved a few pine blocks from his workshop and began to carve horses himself. His children joined him at the fireside fascinated by his clever hands and enchanted by the tale of the first carving. In his telling, they could hear the jingling harness of the woodcutter's horse and feel the magic spark as it had entered the original carving. They were delighted by the idea they would have little wooden horses, just like their father. But his wife fretted the surprise was gone. What fun was there in Christmas, if there wasn't a surprise come morning? So, she rose even earlier than normal the next day, and finished all her many chores before the children woke. After feeding them breakfast, 
and finally setting them to their daily tasks. She went off through the village, looking for inspiration. It was a bright, fine morning, despite the cold, and she felt hopeful. First, she thought the little wooden horses could have reins made of braided thread, but she couldn't spare a scrap from her sewing basket. Every inch was needed to darn socks and repair tears and keep them warm through winter. Then the furniture maker's wife wondered if the little wooden horses should have tails made of long pine needles. It would remind them of the woodcutter, their grandfather, but she knew the needles would get brittle and break too soon. She was coming to the far edge of the village, and her time for planning was running short. There was much to be done back at home, and the furniture maker's wife decided to turn around at the last small house. Her neighbours there had just received a small inheritance, and they had used it to paint their house red. Their house was as glossy and bright as an apple, and looked very cheerful against the white snow. There, at last, was the inspiration she needed. Even earlier the next day, the furniture maker's wife left their warm home and went herself into the forest. Far along a winding trail, a copper mine was nestled deep into the hills. There she bartered fresh-baked bread for a small handful of copper ore. Taking her treasure home, she mixed it with linseed oil and rye flour to make a pot of bright red paint. What a surprise it would be when the children saw their little wooden horses as glossy as red apples. The only trouble was, the clever wife did not have any paint brushes. Those her husband used to treat the pine wood in his workshop were too unwieldy and stiff for the sweet little wooden horses. She'd already used a much-needed ration of their flour to bake bread for the copper miners. So now she had nothing to barter in the village. Their little house was searched, but nothing was found that would make a suitable paintbrush. And by the time the furniture maker returned from his workshop, his wife was in despair. He marvelled at her homemade paint and listened to her woes. And then the furniture maker smiled. There was one way to get paintbrushes for free, he told her, and all they needed was a bit of cooking fat. She scooped a little fat onto a wooden spoon and followed her husband out into the winter evening. Thin, chattering squirrels scampered along the edge of the pine forest and buried the few seeds they could find at the base of the towering trees. Beneath one particularly busy tree, the furniture maker set a snare and his wife laid down the wooden spoon full of fat. Within minutes, a hungry squirrel was caught in the snare and the tip of his tail was all they needed to make a fine paintbrush. Come Christmas morning, the furniture maker's children were ecstatic to discover their little wooden horses had been painted bright red. Their love and the happiness together in that house infused the little wooden horses with all the love and magic the original horse still held. The children felt it and treasured their gifts, and they galloped those beautiful glossy horses through the years until they themselves had grown up. The little wooden horses were indeed charmed but true. Everlasting magic often comes from the hardest challenges. Those children of the furniture maker grew up 
to face a time of war. The battles seemed never-ending, and they touched every village in Sweden. Soldiers loyal to the king were housed with families, and so it was the winter the little wooden horses were sealed with their final magic. War has a horrible way of compounding all woes, and that winter was one of the longest, coldest, and bleakest anyone had ever survived. Many suffered from bone-gnawing hunger, and no matter where anyone turned, food was scarce. The soldiers especially suffered. They knew how they imposed on the families that housed them, and how quickly their minute rations of food ran out. Good in their hearts kept them helpful, and they chopped wood and worked hard beside the farmers and villagers alike, because the only way anyone would survive was to work together. Still, starvation clawed at the soldiers, and they often split ranks in search of food. One such soldier appeared at the window of the furniture maker's youngest child, now a married man with a family of his own. He still kept his little wooden horse on the mantle above the fireplace. Blurry-eyed with hunger, the soldier gazed upon the bright red horse and took a few moments of comfort from hearing the magical tale of its making. The family had nothing more to spare than a small cup of hot broth. But the soldier was grateful. He went back into his cold barracks in a neighbouring barn and dreamt all that night of the beautiful red horse. Horses were also sacred to soldiers. Their strength and bravery unparalleled on the battlefield, and he woke up starving for another look at the little wooden carving. How could he thank the family that had fed him what little they had? How could he share with them his love and belief in the magic power of horses? The soldier took the little wooden horse and hid it under his uniform. Then, he begged his fellow soldiers to help him find paint and brushes. They came back with a few colours. Blue, gold, green, and white. The one that gave him the borrowed paintbrush had a hand that shook badly from hunger. Still, this was a distraction from all they had seen and done, and they gathered around to watch as he carefully began to paint. They were a deeply religious regiment, and it wasn't long before they recognised the wide leaf motif the soldier was using to decorate a tiny saddle. It was a kerbitz, the fast-growing vine that God had made grow out of the desert to shade Jonah's head. Jonah had shunned the vine, his thoughts focused on his poor opinion of those people before him, and the healthy plant had shriveled. If only Jonah had been grateful for the little he was given. If only he had shown God a tiny drop of faith. The vine would have flourished around him. To the soldiers, the wide leaves represented good luck, fertility, and love, all the good things they wished for themselves and those families suffering around them. Their rough hands took turns with the painting, and soon the little wooden horse had a fine saddle, a bright bit and braided reins. It was returned to the mantle where it stood like a miracle to the family that had sorely missed it. Hats in hand, the soldiers explained the symbols they had added, and the family begged them to stay by the fire. Neighbours were invited over to be cheered by the little wooden horse's beauty, and each brought something to add to the soup pot. Soon, 
there was enough stew for everyone, and for one night, they were all warm and full. It was there on the mantelpiece, above the families and strangers, that the little wooden horse received its final blessing of magic. The warmth of that room, the generosity that filled everyone's stomachs, and the wishes for luck in the future were all taken in by the little wooden carving, and kept safe and alive for centuries. Even to this day, the now famous Dala Horse reminds us all that we hold in our hands the power of generosity and love. And it is that magic that generates good luck for everyone, including you. Now, may your dreams be as steady and gentle as the woodcutter's horse, and may you wake to good luck in the morning. Good night, sweet dreams, and I'll be back with another story tomorrow on Soothing Pod. Hello, and welcome to Soothing Pod's Sleep Stories. My name is Joe, and today I would like to help you relax and fall asleep, guided by my voice and the story you are about to hear. Do you believe that some folks are born lucky? Have you ever crossed paths with someone who seemingly never runs out of luck? Then again, what is good luck? Is it the result of good fortune, or just plain hard work, or something else? There is a tale told by the Brothers Grimm called Hands in Luck, and tonight I will be your guide on this tale's adventure. Afterwards, you can decide for yourself whether Hans was really as lucky as he thought himself to be. But before we begin, let's pause for a moment to settle into a relaxed state of mind. And as you breathe in a breath of fresh air, pause again. Then exhale, slowly releasing any tension and worries or cares of the day. Now, before I go on and tell you the tale, you must know that in German, the word for luck is the same as the word for happiness. This tale is about a man named Hans, who worked hard indeed, for seven long years in fact, and, perhaps being the good hard worker that he was, he was content and happy with himself and his labour. So, one fine day, he said to his master, Master, I have served my time. Let me go home and visit my poor mother. Please pay my wages so that I may take my leave. Hans must have been a very good hard worker indeed, because his master agreed to pay him his dues and let him go home. Off Hans went, now with a huge chunk of silver and an extra light step in his walk. Not wanting to lose his fine lump of silver, Hans placed it safely inside a handkerchief and slung this cloth over his shoulders. He came across a man riding a fine horse. Hans thought that he would also like to ride a horse. Perhaps it would make his journey easier. No tripping over stones, no lagging behind the sunset. As Hans was thinking these things, he was also saying them out loud to himself so it was no surprise when the man on horseback heard him. He asked why Hans was not riding a horse himself. Because of this heavy load I must carry, all this silver, 
replied Hans, without thinking much of it. How about we make a deal? Your silver for my horse, said the man. You are too kind, sir, replied Hans. I will gladly give you my silver for the horse. Good luck lugging it all around. Deal done then, said the man. And if you wish the horse to go faster, simply say, Jip. And so, Hans paid for the horse with silver, and off he rode. Quite merry he was now, singing and whistling to himself. No care and no sorrow, a fig for the morrow, we'll laugh and be merry, sing nay down Derry. But after some time, Hans wanted to go faster. He remembered what the man had said. Simply say, Jip. Jip, called Hans to the creature. The horse started to gallop and threw Hans off. The horse kept on running, leaving Hans in the dust. Luckily, a farmer riding a cow came by on the road. He saw at once what had happened and brought the horse back to his master, Hans. Hans' back hurt from being thrown off. He wasn't sure if riding the horse made him happy at all. He looked at the man's cow and thought that it might be a far more pleasant ride. Think of the fine pace I could ride at, Hans thought to himself. Besides getting to have all that milk, butter and cheese as part of the bargain. And so... Hans asked the farmer if he could exchange his humble cow for a fine horse. The farmer agreed that this was a fine trade, jumped on the horse, and left his cow in Hans's company. Now Hans had a fine cow. He could get butter and milk and cheese to curdle. What more could a man want? Hans smiled to himself. But soon, one day turned into two, and as he was not yet at his mother's house, the sun climbed high in the sky, and by midday, Hans was soaked in sweat. His throat felt parched, his tongue quite dry. He longed for a drink of cow's milk, and at no better time than now. He stopped the cow to milk it, holding his leather cap under the udder, and waiting for a drop to fall. But there was not a drop to be had. Poor Hans. All this time he imagined he'd have cheese and milk stored up, just waiting for him. Yet this cow was as dry as the leather of his cap. He could not quench his thirst. He again tried to milk the cow, thinking that more patience was all he needed. This started to irk the beast, and so the troubled cow swiftly gave Hans a kick that sent him flying a foot away, knocking him flat to the ground. Now Hans missed his horse all the more. He lay on the ground a while before coming to his senses. Just his luck, a butcher happened to be walking by, driving a pig in a wheelbarrow. He stopped to help Hans get off the ground and asked Hans what had caused him to fall into such a state. So Hans told him the whole story of what had happened, how he was thirsty, but the cow did not satisfy his thirst. The butcher, upon hearing this, produced a flask of ale. It's not milk you need, the butcher laughed. Hans looked at the flask gratefully but then noticed the pig. How fat it was! And what nice, scrumptious, salty sausages he could make from that animal! I think you can guess what Hans did next. He proceeded to convince the butcher to give him the pig. And the butcher, kind soul that he was, wholeheartedly agreed. Finally, all seemed to be all right for Hans, only a couple of misfortunes, but they had not deterred his spirit in the least. 
Hans smiled at his newest traveling companion, thinking to himself how lucky he was to have scored such a fine beast. And who do you suppose Hans met next on the road? Why, a man carrying a fine white goose. And this man stopped Hans to give him the time. They continued to chat, as travelers often do, and Hans told him the story of his travels, his luck, and his newfound companion. Well, said the man with the goose, indeed what a lucky fellow you are. I myself am going to take this goose to a christening. He is only a young bird, about eight weeks old, but feel now how heavy he is already. How fat and brimming with delicious juices this goose must be. You are right, said Hans, having a feel of the goose himself. He could already imagine the succulent roast, the hot, crispy skin, the dressings and sidings he would enjoy with this fine bird meat. Listen, said the man, you seem a good sort of fellow, so I must warn you. This pig here may get you in trouble. In the village I just came from, a pig was stolen. As we speak, all of the villagers are on the hunt for the thief. Imagine what would become of you if they found you in this manner. Naturally, this news frightened poor Hans. Oh dear, he said. I have no idea where this pig came from, or how it even got to the man who gave it to me. Hmm, not such a great bargain after all. Please, sir, would you take this trouble off my hands? Only if I give you the goose in return, answered the man. A trade is a trade after all, fair and square. Hans was more than willing to oblige, and when the man had made the trade, Hans felt as carefree and lucky as ever. He thought of all the fine things the goose could provide him with. A fat roast, a pot of goose grease to store up for cold winter nights, and feathers for a soft and fluffy plush pillow. Lucky indeed. And if he could gift the pillow to his mother, how happy his mother would also be. Hans continued walking and whistling, smiling to himself at these lovely, lavish thoughts. In the next village he approached, there stood a scissor grinder with his wheel. As he worked, a merry tune escaped his lips. O'er hill and o'er dale, so happy I roam. Work light and live well, all the world is my home. Then who so blithe, so merry as I? Hans watched the grinder for a while and imagined that no man on earth could be happier than the grinder at this moment. You must be well off, Master Grinder, Hans congratulated him. For indeed, you seem so happy at your work. Yes, said the grinder, I am happy, and I have a happy, lucrative trade to speak of. But tell me, where did you get that beautiful goose? I traded it for a pig. And where did you get the pig? I traded a cow for it. And where, pray tell, did you find the cow? I traded a horse for it. And the horse, my good man? Why, the horse was my luckiest find. I traded a lump of silver for it. Now the grinder was curious as could be. And the silver? The silver, yes, well, you see now that was a fine, fine trade. Seven long years of hard labor for a lump of silver. The heaviest lump of silver I ever held. My man, I see you have made your fortune, replied the grinder. My fortune? asked Hans, confused. But I have no silver left. Not today, said the grinder. But you have skill, 
strong hands and a strong mind too. Now if you could use all those three while working my grinder, why you could make anything from a slab of stone, and you could have lucrative work for the rest of your life. All you need is a grindstone such as mine. Have this and the rest will follow. The idea sparked joy in Hans's mind and lit his face with a genuine smile. Then your grindstone it is, he replied. Now, tell me what do you want for it? Nothing more than your goose, said the man. Oh, cried Hans, it would make me so happy to be able to make anything from a slab of stone. And it would fill my heart with deep satisfaction to have lucrative work for the rest of my life. You are right, my friend. All I need is a grindstone such as yours. I give you my goose gladly. And if what you say is true, once I have your grindstone, the rest will follow. The man gave Hans his grindstone, of course, and Hans skipped away with a beaming heart. His eyes, you should have seen how they sparkled with joy and contentment. And if you could see him skipping away, this is what you would have heard him say. Surely I must have been born in a lucky hour. Everything I could want or wish for comes of itself. People are so kind. They really seem to think I do them a favor in letting them make me rich and giving me good bargains. The afternoon sun sank lazily, and when the light was turning purple and the forest grew dim and dark, anyone who would have seen Hans would have thought his mind and heart were dreary too. Yes, he was tired. Yes, he was hungry. But discouraged? Not a drop. Just then, Hans came to a river, laid the stone carefully on the bank nearby, and bent down to cup his hands for a drink. Alas, the stone did not stay by his side, but rolled off the banks and into the river water below. It rolled on and on, swirling in the stream, lost in the chasm. Hans watched the stone as it danced, watched as it sank. And when Hans could see the stone no more, he closed his eyes, fell to his knees, and gave thanks. Tears welled in Hans' eyes, but they were not tears of sadness, they were tears of joy. At last, Hans whispered to no one in particular, at last that heavy stone is out of my sight. How ugly and cumbersome it was. And as Hans stood up to walk the final mile to his mother's house, he whistled again and thought himself the luckiest man alive. How happy am I, cried Hans. And how lucky, luckier than any other man alive in the world today. My heart is light. I am free of all my troubles. With those words, Hans walked on until finally he reached his mother's cottage in the woods. Mother, he said upon greeting her with a single hug and kiss. The road to good fortune and good luck was a wonderful and easy road to travel indeed. So, what do you think of Hans's luck? Did good fortune really follow him along his way? Or was it perhaps just a good way of seeing the world and everything that happened to him? Well, whatever you think, I hope you enjoyed this tale of fortune, and I hope that tomorrow good things will find their way into your path just as they did for Hans. For now, sleep well, sweet dreams, and good night. Until next time on Soothing Pod.